this may seem like a strange place to pause the service. As we've just begun our Torah service, it seems that we should continue right now with reading its sacred words. But today, I wanted to take our Sifre Torah out of the ark while I made these comments. At every bar and bat mitzvah service here in our sanctuary, I comment that our Czech memorial scroll, the one with the word Zahor, remembrance, that Barry is holding, has come to us here at CDT from Loschitz in the former Czechoslovakia. It is a witness, a witness to the stories held within and the teachings of our people, but also a witness to the history of its community, both the simchas and the tragic end. And when our young people take this Torah scroll in their arms, they become a witness as well, not only to the stories in the Torah and the stories of this specific scroll's history, but also witness to the future of the Jewish people. And so as I begin these remarks today, I wanted to be in the physical presence of all of our scrolls, these scrolls that are a witness to the simchas and sorrows of our community. And so along with these scrolls here in the arms of members of our community, each one of us becomes a witness with them. Last year, as our Holy Day season was winding down, I had just returned home from a wonderful evening of celebrating Simchat Torah, still reveling in the festivities of the evening, the unrolling of our Torah scroll around the sanctuary, the celebration of our newest religious school students beginning their journey of learning, and of course, the dancing. In fact, one of my favorite moments of the entire year is being able to circle this room with so many of you, with Mike leading us in festive music and the multiple Sifre Torah, these holy scrolls that reside in the ark behind me in the arms of our community, being passed from person to person, men to women, women to men, adults to children, and back again. This moment each year reminds me of the potential within our Torah, the joy that we have as Jews, and our, how our community can come together and rejoice in our sacred text. Yes, I had just come home from this sacred and joyous moment, got the boys to bed with Marnie and was ready to wind down and get some sleep after the long weeks of the High Holy Days with just the Yiskor service in the morning separating me from some potential quiet here at CDT when I turned on the news. I was shocked, heartbroken, I cried. We did not yet know what was truly going on in the kibbutzim in Gaza, near Gaza, nor would we know the extent of the horror, but it was clear that Israel was being attacked in a way that was unparalleled to anything that had happened before. That morning in Israel, the morning of October 7th changed me, changed us, changed the Jewish world. Not since the Holocaust had that many Jews been killed in a single day. Collectively, we wept for the slain victims and we prayed for the safety of the hostages. And unfortunately, almost one year later, we still pray for the 101 still held in captivity. And while we were all still coming to grips with what happened, in fact, while many of us were sitting in the theater at City Springs just two days later with the broader Atlanta Jewish community, or here in our own sanctuary two days after that, when we hosted the North Metro Service of Healing and Memory, the attacks continued. Now this time it was not the gruesome violence that we saw on that Shabbat Simchat Torah morning from Hamas. And it wasn't only the rockets that Hezbollah had started to send into Israel across its northern border with Lebanon. No, it was a full-throated verbal attack on Israel from around the world. From those we typically expect it from, it's Arab, Arab neighbors who have constantly, since the state's founding, sought to undermine and destroy the Jewish nation, but also, as we have seen in our own country, from both far right and far left, and yet, in many ways, they're the same. Karl Mannheim, in his theories of history, taught that once one goes past a certain point, left or right, they end up meeting again. Stalinist communism and Nazi fascism share the same traits. 
so do far left and far right anti-Semitism, all of which have called for Israel to be delegitimized in the wake of the attacks of October 7th. We have seen these calls in our own communities here in Georgia, in the halls of power in Washington, and most notably and tragically continuing on college campuses around this country. These young people on campuses are choosing to protest Israel, who they view as the big bad wolf of the international arena, without even an iota of understanding of what is truly going on in the Middle East. These protests are merely anti-Semitism dressed up as something else. For if we were to examine closely the language and the criticism of Israel, we would be able to see the same classic anti-Semitic tropes at play. Israel is a globalist manipulator. Israel is a bloodthirsty warmonger. Israel is an immoral society. Israel is the sole cause of all the problems in the world, and so on, and so on. So now we see these Jewish stereotypes being applied to Israel as justifications for calls for a global intifada. And an intifada not only against the people of Israel, but against all of us Jews. The calls have amplified through the year as the war in Gaza continued, as Hezbollah has attacked Israel from the north, and as we witnessed with bated breath and prayers emanating from most of us a night back in April and then again this past week where hundreds of rockets and missiles were fired at Israel from Iran. Israel and the Jewish people are being faced with the double threat of physical violence as well as being made a scapegoat on an international scale. In fact, the British political theorist Alan Johnson observed, what the Jew once was an older anti-Semitism, uniquely malevolent, full of bloodlust, all controlling, the hidden hand, tricksy, always acting in bad faith, and I can keep going, the Jewish state now is the recipient of these age-old tropes. So even when Israel is the one being attacked, the anti-Semite, anti-Zionist, can only see Israel as the oppressor, can only see Israel as the one committing the atrocities. And one of the scariest parts is that even in the first days after October 7th, even while Israelis were still burying their dead, and many around the world started looking at both sides of the story. Now, I will be one of the first people, and you've heard me say it before, that Israel has not been perfect and can always do better. I will also loudly proclaim that innocent Palestinians have suffered tremendously with too many civilians on both sides of this conflict having suffered. But in this case, there are no two sides. There can be no whataboutisms, no justifications. When it comes to the Hamas massacre of innocent Israeli civilians, when it comes to the jihadi culture of Hamas and ISIS and Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda, there is only wrong, definitively, no context required. There was no other conceivable side. But as Dara Horn, the brilliant author of People Love Dead Jews, has so correctly pointed out, six million Jews don't have to die for us to consider it to be a cataclysmic event for 1,200 or even one. The insidiousness lies in the stepping stones, the dominoes. Because if we don't put an end to the spread of anti-Jewish hate on the internet, if we don't put an end to people chanting from the river to the sea, if we don't put an end to people tearing down posters of children kidnapped by a terrorist organization, if we don't put an end to people romanticizing another intifada, if we don't put an end to university presidents allowing the call for genocide in the name of free speech, it will happen again. We have seen over the past year the constant anti-Semitic rhetoric, the hordes of students on campus camping out around the country, the protests in major cities, including here in Atlanta, that include calls for violence against Israel and against Jews, young people in our local high schools who do not know the real meaning of the kafia, wearing them in solidarity with Hamas. And we have seen real violence, including the tragedy of October 7th and other acts of violence against Jews and our institutions. And even in the past days, 
After hearing the news that the Israeli Defense Forces had killed the longtime leader of the terrorist group Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, Yamak Shamo, who had the blood of hundreds of Israeli, Lebanese, Christians, Syrian Muslims, and 241 U.S. military personnel, including 220 Marines at the barracks 40 years ago on his hands, there were still protests that Israel had even done such a thing. It is horrifying. It is maddening. The cuts are real and they are deep. And Horn's warning is all too real as well. If we do not speak out and act against this hatred, it will only continue to spiral. But I will tell you this, there is hope. Israeli activist, actress, and writer Noah Tishby, who served as Israel's special envoy for combating anti-Semitism, wrote in her book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Jew, that she offered with, authored along with Emmanuel Akko. If I were to tell you, she says, that there was a tiny group of people who existed thousands of years ago, and every few decades, the largest empires in the world would intentionally try and kill them. And if I told you that the same group survived not once, not twice, not three times, but over and over and over again, and then thrived, a rational person would tell you it was statistically impossible. That makes zero sense, but that is the Jewish people. Their persistence, not to mention their achievements. In the thick of turbulence and trauma is nothing short of miraculous. Every single Jew, every one of us, is a survivor. We are all survivors. The fact that we survived the Greeks, the Romans, the Crusades, the Inquisition, and the Nazis is a miracle. And we will survive Hamas, and Hezbollah, and the Ayatollahs in Iran. But not only that, we will survive the ignorant, uninformed hatred from young people on college campuses, as well as from foreign governments seeking to place all of their blames for the world's problems at the feet of the single Jewish state. Because that is what we do. We survive. We survive because we must. We survive because we have a sacred calling to repair the world. We survive because we are commanded Kol Yisrael Aravim Zebazeh, all of Israel. Each one of us is responsible for one another. Tishbi remarks about the current conflict in Gaza I have no idea how this war ends. I really don't. But I can tell you this. In the Jewish community, we have been through such hell in the past, and sadly, we know how to get through this. So I see already stories of unity and help and friendship and community all over the world that are helping the Jewish people and helping Israel. The Jewish people, our community here at CDT and around the world are incredibly strong. We have survived and we will continue to survive because that has been our call. We have said a lot and we will continue to say, Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel live. These words are our mandate. They are our charge. The people of Israel live, will continue to live. We aren't going anywhere. So as we are moving forward, as we continue to support one another, support Israel, and support the worldwide Jewish community, we know that there will be tough moments ahead. But there are some concrete things we can do to ensure Am Yisrael Chai. The first thing we can do is show up and ask others to show up as well. Acknowledge your hurt, yes, but also acknowledge how important it is when our non-Jewish friends and neighbors check on us, when they speak out against anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Acknowledge that allyship. Tishbi remarks, you see, we are not asking people to hide us in their attics. We are not those people anymore. We're asking them to come out of hiding for us. Each one of these acts contributes in ways that might feel small, but add up to big changes. But I'd argue the easiest place to start is figuring out how to simply speak up. For when our allies speak up, when they learn the truth about what is happening in the world and not blindly follow those who speak against Israel and Jews on social media, when they support us as the Jewish people, we gain strength in this fight against those who seek to diminish us. And I want to take a moment and once again thank all of our allies, all of our community leaders, who are here today. Thank you.
And for those of us in the Jewish community, we must not stay silent. And I'm not just talking about responding online. I'm talking about responding in real life. Ignore the comments on your feeds and invite your non-Jewish friends or colleagues for Shabbat or a holiday meal. Bring them here for services at CDT. Help them learn about the real situation. And as Tishbe urges us, stop hiding. We have tried that for generations, and it never works. We have tried to fit in or be something that we are not forever. And that software, it needs to be updated. Being Jewish is such an honor and has so much to teach us. Who are we to hide it? Instead, be loud and proud of your Jewish identity. Learn the stories. Enjoy the holidays. Find your own personal connection to our ancient tribe and embrace it. After 55 days in captivity, Mia Shem was one of the hostages lucky enough to be released. Following her return to Israel, she tattooed the words, We will dance again, on the, and the date October 7th, 2023, on her arm. These words are a tribute to the many young people who were murdered at the Nova Music Festival and are filled with hope that we will be able to dance again. Some days it feels hard. Some days the weight of what is happening in Israel what is happening on college campuses, and what is happening in our own backyards seems too much to bear. But our tradition says that we must dance again. We must celebrate. Our tradition builds in days of celebration, Purim, Simchat Torah, and it builds in the moments too. For the last 15 minutes, we have been on the precipice of one of those moments. Each time that we take the Sifrei Torah from the Ark, we are given an opportunity to dance, to celebrate our history, as well as the promise of the future that Torah holds within its sacred words. The last year has been exceedingly difficult. It has been challenging, and it has been heartbreaking in so many ways. Yet the Sifrei Torah, our sacred scrolls, stand here as witness, along with every person in this room, that we will dance again. So I'd like everyone now, if you are able, Please rise. And now, lifting our voices, clapping our hands, moving our feet and bodies, leave your seats. I'd like to ask each one of you to join me and our Torahs in celebrating the pride that we have in our Jewish community, the pride we have in being connected by these ancient words, the pride we have in saying that we, will, we stand together, the pride we have in exclaiming, Am Yisrael Chai! The people of Israel do live, and we will dance again. <laughs> 